It all started in 1881 when Harley Proctor, the son of Proctor and Gamble co-founder William Parker and a legendary soap salesman in his own right, decided that he needed a new angle to be able to promote their uh, product, Ivory Soap, that he needed to be able to have something that he could say about the soap that was going to make it a major player in the soap market, that was going to be able to develop them uh, more people buying their soap. Now, back then in 1881, just like today, people were impressed oftentimes by the scientific pronouncements. If they could get some scientific claim that they could make concerning their soap, they were sure that they were going to be able to make so more sales. And so Harley decided that he could, if he could come up with a lab test to, pr uh, to prove that their soap was more pure than the other soaps on the market at the time, that this would be a good way to sell soap. The trouble was with this that there was no standard for deciding what was pure soap. So he sent it off to a research company to, de to determine what would be a pure soap. And that uh, lab uh, showed uh, that uh, decided that the way to decide whether a soap was pure or not was to, uh, was to be able to say what content it had of the fatty acids and alkali that most soaps were made of. If it was mostly made up of fatty acids and alkali, it would be a purer soap than those that had other additives or other contaminants in them. And so that became the established test for what was a pure soap, the fatty acids and the alkalis that were in the soap. They did a test in their research labs on ivory soap and found out that uh, of the contaminants that were in the soap, uh, the impure impurities, that there was 0.11 percent, that's 11 hundredths of 1 percent, of uncombined alkali carbonates. Carbonates were uh, 0.28 or 28 hundredths of 1 percent. And mineral matter in the soap was at 0.17 percent or 17 hundredths of 1 percent, totaling 56 hundredths of 1 percent, thinking that 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure had just the right touch of technical authenticity to appeal to the great unwashed, so to speak. Harley began sticking that uh, banner on his soap and using it in their promotionals of ivory soap and a classic marketing strategy was born. You know, there's many other commercial brands today that uh, present their products as being 100% real or 100% authentic. And it reminds us of the fact that these things appeal to us, that we look for these things in a product because we want something which is genuine. We don't want something which is a cheap copy of something. We don't want something which is not what it pretends to be. We want the genuine article. And nowhere is that more true than in love. Fake love is not something which we desire. A marriage established on fake love is cold and sterile. It leads to defection from the commitments made when that marriage was established. When a parent's love produce, uh, is uh, proved to be a farce for their children, it leaves lasting scars on the child raised in that environment. A fake love expressed in friendship proves the, not to be a friendship in truth at all. And when our outward devotion is only a feigned love for God, he is mocked by our religious performance. Love should abound in the fellowship of the church, but we've seen all too often the phony love revealed in a cold church fellowship where only the pretense of concern for each other is expressed in those uh, exaggerated poses of love. We want authentic love. We don't want the cheap knockoff. The Christian faith allows a person to see the actual nature of love with all the worldly corruption stripped away. It's in the Christian faith that we have real love revealed to us. Pure, refined, unadulterated love. That's what's on display in our text this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, we're going to use for our text this morning. And there we have these words. 
We have come to know and have believed that the love which God, the love which God has for us, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this love is perfected in us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. A great passage on love we have for our text this morning. One of the things our passage talks about is God's love for us. It points out that God's very nature is love. God is love, our passage says. God is love personified. Everything that we can know about love, we can see in God. We can see it in God's works. We can see it in creation. When God formed everything out of nothing, when God spoke into existence all which now exists, we see God's love in that creative act. All things that he made, he made with regard for us. And his creation of us was for the purpose that we might have fellowship with him. That he might know our fellowship, that we might have a relationship with him. So all of God's creation points to his love. We see it in his continued work as well. He didn't just create us and leave it at that, a one-time act of love way back in history. He continues his creative work. He holds all things together. His creative work is constant in our lives. With every generation that's born, with every cycle that's completed in nature, we see God's hand still expressing love today. And God is constant in his watch care over us, ever ready to intercede on behalf of those who belong to him, giving us all that is good for us to have. And in this we see his love. We find out in God's word even his discipline expresses love. His acts towards us as a loving, he acts towards us as a loving father does for his children. A loving father does not withhold discipline from their children because they care about how their children turn out, about how they're maturing. They want them to know that there's consequences for doing wrong. And so a loving God also acts with discipline in his creature's life uh, because he loves us. He establishes his discipline for us. Our passage says, we have come to know the love God, which God has for us. We have come to know. I think, you know, from our earliest moment, we can experience God's love. But we don't appreciate it in its fullness. And it really takes some maturing before we're able to appreciate God's love. The love that God has for us, we have come to know God's love for us. The more time we spend with God, the more his loving nature is apparent with us. The longer that we walk with God, the more it is a testimony to us that our God is love. In the hard circumstances and in the good circumstances, we have that testimony of God's love. His love envelops us. His love isn't just sunshine on our face. It's overwhelming us. It becomes our atmosphere, the place in which we move and live and breathe. We don't just experience his love. We live in his love. And that love is so transformational that we who belong to him have a merging with him. As our passage says here, in his love, we come to live in him and he comes to live in us all because of his love for us. And our passage goes on to say this about experiencing God's love. Experiencing God's love gives us security. We don't have to live according to fears any longer. 
We don't have to live according to our doubts because perfect love casts out fear. Heaven is no longer a faraway dream of something that's been promised to us and we might achieve someday. Heaven becomes a reality, the place of our destination because we trust in the one who promised it to us. We have confidence, as our passage says here, in the day of judgment. You know, most people looking toward that day when, of accountability, that day of judgment, when they will stand before the Lord, do so with fear and trembling, remembering all the, the wrong that they've done in their lives, all the words that they've said that have hurt other people, all the acts that they've done to undermine other people. But we have confidence as we look towards that day of judgment because we know that our guilt has been taken away through His Son, Jesus Christ. His love is realized in our hearts and our minds, and it helps us to see the reality of His grace. We don't have to be good enough anymore. We don't want to get what we deserve because our acts would only condemn us. That's the difference between karma and grace, by the way. Everybody talks about karma. They've done something good, so good's going to come back to them. They've done something evil, so evil's going to come back to them. You know, some karmic cosmic force is going to establish justice. Well, that's the last thing we want. We don't want justice. We don't want to get what we deserve because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What we deserve is condemnation. What we deserve is death. But we don't live according to karma. We live according to grace in Christ Jesus. We don't have to be good enough. Our conviction is that he is good enough. And that he loves us enough to apply his good to the lives of all of us who will receive him. For as many as received him, he gave them the right to be called the sons of God. We've been adopted into his family. There's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who don't trust in God's love can never be secure in their salvation. They're always going to have that doubt about whether they're good enough whether they're going to stand up to God's judgment. But those who know his love, trust in his promise. Real love means that you never have to fear again. Our passage doesn't just talk about God's love for us. It also talks about our love for God. We love, our passage says, because he first loved us. He is the first cause. His love is the primary love. The best we can do is to respond in kind to him. The best we can do is to reflect some of that love back towards him. But that's the way that we respond to knowing his love. To know him is to love him. To recognize the love of God kindles in us a love for him in our hearts and in our minds. And if we can't generate a love for God... If we find it impossible to be consistent in our love for him, it means that we have failed to see God's love or somehow we become desensitized to seeing God's love around us to where it no longer impacts us. That's the only way that we can fail to respond in love to God is if we don't recognize his love for us. We love him, again, because he first loved us. Love always flows from the mature to the immature. Have you thought about that? We don't start out being perfect in love. A newborn baby doesn't know much about love at all. It knows when the lights are too bright. The baby knows when the drafts are too cold. It knows when the diapers are too wet. And it knows when the belly is too empty. And they cry and complain until that self-appreciated need is met. Babies are very self-centered. It's natural. They're immature. They haven't grown to appreciate love. They are filled with self. Love's nature, though, is selfless. But only maturity allows someone to be able to see beyond themselves, to be able to see beyond their wants, their needs, and to have that selfless concern for another. A parent showers the baby with love, and the baby grows to be able to discern that love and to respond to that love. It flows from the mature to the immature. And so God shined his love on our infant hearts 
faithfully, unwaveringly, until we could respond to that love. The greatest discovery we have in our lives is that we are loved by God and the best thing that can come out of our lives is a sincere love for him. Our passage talks about God's love for us. It refers to our love for God. There's one other thing I want you to see in this text this morning, and that is our love for others. God's love for us is the source for our love for him. And likewise, our love for him is the source for our love for others. I want you to consider this for a moment. People are stubborn. People are abrasive. People are hateful. People are shallow. They are crude. They are insensitive. And we've only started in on the list. People are remarkably unlovable. And if you dare to love one of these flawed beings, you're going to have your heart wounded at one time or another. Because of their flaws, because of their prickles, their thorns, as you love them, it's going to hurt you from time to time. Because people around us are unlovely, unlovable in some cases. In fact, some, loving some of the less lovable members of the species can produce almost constant heartache in your life. It's so much safer to build a wall around your heart and surround that wall with barbed wire. But God loved those stubborn, unreasonable, offensive beings. And when we come to love him, we come to love like him. We don't just love God. We come to be more like him in the way that we're able to love. That love that he has for the other people who are around us is the love that we start having for other people as well. We start to see people around us through the lenses of his love-colored glasses. We started seeing that, that little God spark created in all of us. We see those little acts of kindness that burst out occasionally from those unlovable people. We see their tender hearts. We see the desire to be better than they are. And suddenly, those unlovable people become downright adorable. We start caring about their lives. We hope for them. We pray for them. We encourage them. And we look for ways that we can help them with their burdens. We start understanding that God loves us in spite of all of our prickly ways. That God's somehow able to love us in spite of all of our faults, in spite of all of our failures, in spite of all of the hardness of our heart towards him at times. We want to express that same genuine love to those flawed people who are around us. Our passage tells us very plainly this morning, you cannot love God and remain indifferent to the people who are around you, especially those who are brothers or sisters in Christ. You can't claim to love God and not love your brother. If someone says, our passage says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Couldn't be put any more plainly, could it? You can't love God and have a disregard for your fellow man. You can't love God and dislike the person in the pew next to you. You can't love God and want something bad to happen to the people around you. Real love for God pushes those things away. The hurts, the pain, the resentment. And it leaves us in a position to be like God. To love them sometimes in spite of themselves. And to see better for them because we have loved them. The church should be the most loving assembly on the face of this earth. It should be a beacon of love into the lives of others. And we can't afford to be indifferent or uncaring. Love is the essential, and love must find an expression in us. That really brings us to our invitation time today. 
Our invitation is to see God's love for us, to radiate our love for him, and express that love towards others. Enough with cold churches mouthing the word love and unable to express the real thing. We need genuine love. Romans chapter 12 verse 9 says, Let love be genuine. This morning, if you'd like to let love be genuine in your heart, if you'd like to turn yourself over to Jesus Christ for salvation or like to renew your commitment to be a loving person in your life, whatever decision you need to make this morning, we want you to have the opportunity. We invite you to come forward as we stand and sing our invitation song, I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. Let's stand.